Hi YouTube, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can find me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. Alright, so this is video, oh I don't know, maybe 17? 17 or 18, one of the two. Um, we got our, our new knife pattern. We got them etched, uh, well, this one right here got uh, my mark etched and then the finishes etched yesterday. Um, so this one right here is fresh out of the WD-40. This one right here, um, we did clean it off, uh, you know, to, to, to take a look at the hardening line quite a bit more. So now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and prep them for uh, installing the handles. You know, in one of the other videos, we actually made the handle scales, made sure they were flat, um, you know, cut the rough profiles out, you know, drilled the holes, you know, all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to go over today is actually... Um, doing the glue up, okay, where we actually install the scales to the knife permanently. Um, and we'll start off with the epoxy, okay. So here in my shop, I use two classes of epoxy, okay. One of them is this West Systems G Flex stuff, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. Heard of this? This stuff is um, it's pretty freaking incredible, I think. I want to say it was originally designed for uh, something to do with boats, um, like uh, doing patches on like fiberglass boats or something like that. Um, but I know it's pretty dang incredible. It um, it is a long cure type epoxy, um, four or four or twenty four hours, something like that. Uh, oh, okay, uh, pot life is forty five minutes at seventy two degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, working time is 75 minutes. Uh, clamp parts together until cured three hours with residual curing over the next day or two. Okay, so when I use this stuff, you mix it up and you really don't have to worry about setting a timer, um, you know, for uh, uh, getting all your parts glued up and everything uh, because you've got, you know, 75 minutes worth of working time. I mean, that's a lot. Um, and as long as you have everything prepped as if you were to use a faster curing epoxy by the time you start using this stuff you'll be like yeah you know I got gobs and gobs of time this stuff cures very hard but it's also got a little bit of flexibility to it which might be where the the flex comes in okay so I use this stuff on uh, rough use type of knives okay so like um, you know, like a like a handyman's knife. You know, something that you're used going to be digging in the dirt. You know, chipping your way through ice to get to a sh uh, frozen shut off valve, uh, cutting shingles, insulation, digging, uh, prying open painted shut windows. You know, I mean that kind of a rough use type of knife or choppers. You know, a knife that's going to be getting an awful lot of impact. Okay, that's where I use G Flex at. Um, you know, I guess I could use it everywhere, but um, uh, but I, that's just what I use it for, is hard use type knives. The other class of epoxy I use is the five minute quick cure type, okay? This right here just happens to be from our local hobby town. And this, I want to say, um, is the same stuff that I got from Pops at one time. So this five minute type epoxy um, I usually really like the Loctite brand, um, and it just so happened that the last time I, I was out of epoxy, um, I used to get it at Home Depot, and they're they're almost well, they're kind of in between these two sizes, and it's it's a, still a two part type epoxy, and I want to say I gave twenty bucks for it, um, and it would last, you know. Well, depending on, on the month, you know, how many knives I was making. But, you know, it would last, you know, anywhere from a month to, say, six months, something like that. Just kind of depending upon what, I, what, I, what it was I was making. I was out of it, and I went there and uh, went to the store, and they didn't have any. So I went to Hobby Town, and I picked up this version. So the three different types of that five-minute epoxy that I've used have been the Loctite brand in either the, you know, fairly large bottles, or they have one that's in like a like a double syringe. That works really good if you're only going to be making a couple of knives or um, you know you just need a little bit to get you through a project. Uh, so the Loctite 5 minute uh, 
epoxy. This stuff right here, this uh, quick cure, either stuff from you know uh, Pop Supply or uh, this local hobby town. I would guess that they're all kind of pretty much the same. Um, and the reason that we uh, use the five minute stuff for this type of handle attachment is because it does cure in five minutes or so. Now today we we'll have to talk about temperature for a little bit. Um, this morning the shop is <coughs> 50 degrees. I think it was 25 degrees outside last night or so. Um, so the insulation in the shop's working out really good. But the epoxy is on the cold side, okay? Um, like when I was reading this thing right here, uh, I don't know if you know a whole lot of about a, a po I don't know if you know a whole lot about epoxy, but there's a couple of different things that you're. I mean, I guess we'll just go ahead and explain it here on this bottle, and then you'll kind of know. Um, when it says your uh, your pot life, okay, so that's the amount of time that you have where well, your pot life and your working time is kind of about the same, okay? So you mix it. And then you've got, you know, in this case, 45 to 75 minutes, you know, before it really starts setting up and you shouldn't bother it anymore. Okay, so in that amount of time, you need to get uh, that epoxy mixed up and applied to your project and pressure applied. And then, you know, in that amount of time and then stop messing with it and then just set it off to the side and let it cure. It's going to have most of your cure, like it says here. Um, it says uh, three hours uh, with residual curing over the next day or two. Um, so you'll, you know, you mix it up. You go ahead and you apply it. You apply pressure, however you're going to do that, whether your clamps, your fasteners, or whatever, and then you set it off to the side, and you don't mess with it for you know, in the next day or so. Now, that first initial cure is going to be, in this case, three hours, okay? So in three hours, it's going to be mostly set up. But it won't reach its full strength until, in this case, the next day or two for G-Flex, okay? The five-minute stuff, it's the same deal. You're going to have, like, a five-minute working time. So you mix it. you got five minutes to get it in place, get your pressure applied, and get it to a safe place so that you're not going to mess with it no more. Then I typically let them sit until the next day. So in this case here, it is 11 o'clock now. <coughs> um, we'll go ahead and glue up these two uh, that we're working on. If we have any extra, then we'll go ahead and do the, the next couple of knives, finish out the video, then I'll glue up the rest of them, and then I won't come back in here tomorrow, Sunday, heck, I might not come back out here and work on them until Monday morning. You know, That gives them plenty of time to cure and get ready for the next step. Okay, so the, uh, and I'm almost out of pins. That was poor planning on my part. Well, I guess I'll show you how we make pins here. Okay, so we went over the epoxy. The other things you're going to need is I use popsicle sticks. Clean ones, not, um, you know, not ones from eating popsicles. These little bitty cups right here, um, I've called them, or you can buy them uh, medicine cups. Um, or the, the local hobby town sells these. I'm sure that Michael's Hobby Lobby, um, any place like that would sell those. Uh, typically I like to mix my epoxy in these little cups versus, you know, like on a piece of sc uh, scrap cardboard or something like that. Um, and then I use these, well, I call them rubber gloves, but they're nitro gloves. So some sort of disposable gloves so you don't get the stuff all over your hands. All right, so the first thing that we need are pins. And I thought I had some pin stock already cut up, and I don't. So, let's grab some pin stock. So this is just eighth inch brass pin stock, or eighth inch brass rod from Home Depot or, you know, from wherever. Okay, the fastest way I've seen to, or uh, found to make this is to clamp it up in your bench vise. Let's get you kind of closer here. Can you see the tip of it? There you go. And then these are um, uh, 
I'm not even sure what you call these, but these are uh, kind of a cross between wire cutters and bolt cutters. You've got your camming action there, so they're kind of like just a mini set of bolt cutters, right? And we're going to need pieces that are about hmm, that long. Okay, so you can just go ahead and, you know, cut the first one and then just, just keep right on going. Now these pins right here, the first set of pins that we're going to use are likely not going to be the pins that are going to stay in the finished knife. Okay, these are mostly assembly pins. And honestly, this is kind of wasteful. Because you're cutting this pin stock, you're going to use it, and then honestly, they get so gooped up that after a couple of uses, I just throw them away. Or, you know, throw them in the, the brass pile. And then the next time I need to cast something out of brass, you know, then they just get melted down with, you know, plumbing parts and whatever, and then, um, and then you cast your project out of them. So I guess, you know, it's not a complete waste. And that one's got the tag on it, so we'll set it off to the side. Okay. <clears throat> now, the nice thing about those cutters versus like a saw is that they leave a pretty good it's almost like they leave a tapered point okay so that tapered point will go into your your hole pretty easy without catching all right remember these holes are made with a uh, number 30 drill bit which leaves a uh, 0.128 diameter hole and we are using eighth inch pin stock, which is 0.125. All right, let me grab my apron. <coughs> okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and set these two blades up and I'll show you two different ways to do it. I tell you, I, uh, just as a side note, I told you in another video that um, I've got a bad stomach and I've been on Pregnizone for a while. And, uh, uh, boy, that stuff, I packed on 20 pounds in like a month and a half. The first, uh, I mean, I've been on it since, I've been on it since uh, like December. And uh, the first couple of months weren't too bad. And then all of a sudden it was like, I mean, it, it you know, it, it did the job that the doctor prescribed it to do, but then the side effects, it, uh, uh, it would, I didn't notice a whole lot except for a whole bunch of like uh, anger issues. And then um, after, after those kind of went away, kind of, you know, kind of got used to it, I guess, or, you know, quit, quit being angry is so much. But then everything else was doing good, and then all of a sudden, boy, it was like it built up in my system, and bam, I just started gaining a whole bunch of weight. My face blew up. Um, just not such a good time. I took my last one today. Um, the new medicine seems to be working pretty good, and, um, uh, and I'm kind of starting to notice I'm, I'm you know, taking up some notches in my belt a little bit, and hopefully my apron will fit the way it's supposed to again here pretty soon, because, man, it just... It just tight and it's not fitting right way. Anyway, so on this one right here, um, we're going to do it uh, the quick and dirty way, okay? So we're not going to tape up the, the blade, not at this step, okay? Now what we do need to do is we need to clean it. All right, so we're going to take a couple of these pins. What the heck's going on there? That didn't slide in there very very easy at all. There it goes. Okay. So we've got our two pins installed and we got one scale on, right? Okay, so now, I mean, you can take a pencil and, you know, draw yourself a line where the, the top of the scales are going to be. Or you can place your thumbnail right up against the, the scales, right? Then, without moving your thumbnail remove the scales take yourself some sandpaper this just happens to be the um, I think this is 320 grit uh, from my hand sanding station 
Now, kind of imagine where the line of the scales are going to run and go a little bit in from there, okay? And then just sand up to your thumbnail. Now here, we're not trying to do a finish or anything. We're just trying to remove the top layer of oxid ox of stuff <laughs> um, that's on that steel so that the epoxy um, doesn't get contaminated, okay? So now we can flip it to the other side and you can just kind of eyeball where your thumbnail should go and do the same thing on the other side. The nice thing about working with high carbon steel like this is that it's going to patina. And so if you have like any, um, I mean, if you're making working knives, um, it's going to patina and cover those little scratches over time. All right, so we pull those out. Now this one right here, remember I told you yesterday we etched this in acid for 10 minutes at this room temperature and that mix of acid and everything, right? We pull it out of that, we put it into our TSP solution for 10 minutes to let it neutralize the acid. Then we rinse it off and we put it in WD-40, just a jar of it. You can get that stuff in big old cans, you know, not just a, so don't go out and buy like a whole bunch of spray bottles and sit there spraying them into a jar. Just buy the big can and you can pour it in there. Um, and that WD-40 is gonna leave like a waxy coating on the blade, right? Or on anywhere that it touched. So in that case, you can either do one of two things. You can either take your tape, and I like this blue painter's tape. You can either take your tape and wrap directly on the blade, or you can take just a little scrap of copy paper. And then get it, you know, about there, fold it over. And make yourself a little paper sheath. And I got that one a little too tight. Okay. And take your tape. And there you go. Now you've got a little paper sheath. You can keep it around. It's custom fit to that blade so it'll stay on. And then you can use that to do your work. Now the same thing here, I still like to use my thumb as a stop um, when I go to sand. Now you can um, after you get done sanding these, so once we sand these um, for the most part, we're going to have what they call a mechanically clean surface, okay? We know it's a mechanically clean surface because we removed the top layer of that surface, and now we expose the bottom layer of the surface, which hasn't been in contact with anything but the sandpaper and the little bit of gunk that's on the sandpaper from the, you know, the prior stroke, and bam, it's clean, right? If you want to, or if you're having problems with your epoxy bond, you can go ahead and clean it with acetone or denatured alcohol or any kind of grease remover, anything like that, uh, like a spray brake cleaner or something like that would work pretty good too. Um, honestly, I've nev never really had a problem with that with you know a mostly mechanically clean surface and these two grades of epoxy or with um, uh, something like JB Weld or anything like that. A big part of that is these extra holes, okay? These extra holes, not only do they act to kind of lighten the back end of the knife, because epoxy is gonna be lighter than steel is, right? Okay, but mostly what these are there for is they're called epoxy rivets, okay? So what happens is, is you put this section, you know, you put this tang on here, right? Well, the parts that don't have holes, you're relying on the, the um, heavy, or, you know, the texture of the surface to give the epoxy something to grab a hold of, right? Now, the second you start 
drilling extra holes that don't have anything in them. Now that epoxy has got a path from one side of the tang to the other side of the tang. Okay, so it makes rivets that are, frankly, they're they're surprisingly strong. You make epoxy rivets into your knife handle. Combine those with a good quality epoxy and pins that are peened right. No, actually, even if they're not peened right, I mean, even if they're, they're not peened at all, you will have a surprisingly strong handle. Once we get finished with this handle, the fastest and the easiest way to get rid of this handle is with a four pound hammer on an anvil. Okay, what you do is you take that knife and that handle and you go sit it over there on the anvil and you whack it with a four pound hammer and you bust that handle off. Um, sometimes it takes a little while, depends on what kind of handle material you've selected and everything, but it will eventually come off of there. The only thing you have to worry about is mangling up the tang and bending it back and forth while you're taking the handle off. Okay, <clears throat> But that's about the cleanest way I've found to take one of these off. All right, so now that we've got this uh, mostly mechanically cleaned and everything, you'll want to go back over and double check your finish. You know, make sure, you know, you've uh, uh, it's where you want it to be. Double check your scales, make sure that they're flat, you know, make sure that they uh, they fit with the, the tang and everything, all right? Um, which the rest of these are. Um, I just saved these two to, to show you. Make sure you got your pins and that your pin hole or your pins fit inside the pin holes. This is actually backwards on this one. Okay? Like that. Now, <clears throat> um, when you're using fresh bottles of epoxy, you know, where they're mostly full, I don't really worry about this, but once you get down to where you're at that last little bit of epoxy in the bottle, Make yourself a, an epoxy stand. Let's see where you at here. An epoxy stand, and all this is is a, a chunk of two by four or two by three that was, you know, whichever one, and it's got these holes, you know, with a uh, a tapering bit. Just drill yourself a couple of holes in there, and it makes you a stand that you can hold, you know, stick your epoxy in and it can fall down and it, it holds them, you know, nice and secure on the bench top. Okay, works way better than trying to find a spot, you know, to, um, uh, to lean them up against. But we don't have that problem with these. Okay, so <clears throat> now we need our timer. Okay. You can either set it for five minutes and count down or, you know, just push the button when you're ready to go. Let's throw some gloves on. <coughs> okay. So, um, with this five minute stuff, I have noticed that if you were, okay, so this, this little cup right here goes up to eight drams. With the five minute stuff, I have noticed that if you were to fill, um, you know, to four drams or, you know, pick tablespoons or um, mills or cc's, you know, whatever you want to use. But if you were to put four drams in here of this half and then put four drams of the other half to where you have eight drams in there. First of all, that doesn't give you a whole lot of, of room in the top to mix without it coming out and making a mess and getting all over everything. Second of all, that much epoxy, when this stuff starts kicking, you know, when the chemical reaction happens and it starts producing heat and it starts setting up, <coughs> um, it'll actually like kick way too fast and you won't get your five minutes working time. You'll actually get more like a minute and a half and all of a sudden, bam, it's got so much heat, it just kicks off and it becomes, you know, solid, and that's it. Actually, since this is the new shop and everything, let's uh, let's double check. That other stuff is over here. I'm getting away from myself. This whole new shop and things, you know, I'm still getting used to where I put everything. Okay, this right here is just little bitty scraps of paper towel. 
Okay, cutting little bitty squares. All right, and this right here is a pellet tin full of some WD-40, just a little bit in the bottom. And then we have little bitty cotton swabs. Okay, grab one of them, stick it in your WD-40 thing, and let it start absorbing the WD-40, which you don't even have to put it on there. I mean, it'll grab it and capillary action will suck it up. So, okay, so back to this part. So instead of going four drams, um, since we're just doing two knives for the video mostly, let's just go ahead and do two. Because two is going to make four, and four is going to be uh, enough to do probably half of these knives. So maybe, maybe if we just do half, maybe if we do one. And this stuff is, like I said, it's kind of cold, about 50 degrees. Um, so that's going to make it kind of a pain in the butt because, uh, you know, it doesn't want to flow as fast. So like you could see that I poured, uh, poured some in there and then we got to wait and let it settle because it's actually peaking inside there. Uh, peaking is in like mounding up and then it's got to take a little while for it to settle back down on itself. Okay, so that's a little bit, um, that's going to be like five-eighths of the way to the line, so we'll mix a little bit more in there. That'll be good. Now you don't actually have to make it to each line, you know, I mean you can go like, you know, that's a little bit over one, so then when you go to add the other part, you know, you go a little bit over two, you know, kind of just eyeball it. I don't think it really matters if it's exactly exact. Okay, so now we're just a hair over one. So we're going to mound that stuff up to where it's a hair over two, you think? Or we guess it's going to be a hair over two. Now, technically, this will be the start of our five minute time, okay? I always kind of think that the second those two epoch or the second the two parts touch, there could be a chemical reaction starting right then, all right? So we're gonna need a little bit more. About that much, I think. Mm, here more. Okay. So that's gonna be pretty close to half and half. So at this point, we're gonna start our timer. <clears throat> so we know how much time has passed. Take our epoxy mixing stick and we're going to start mixing it. Now try to mix it to where you don't introduce as many air bubbles. Honestly, you're going to get air bubbles one way or another anyway, right? Hopefully when you apply pressure um, to the scales, they will, uh, you know, force most of the air bubbles out. Okay, so I like to mix for a full minute to start with. And I also forgot to grab clamps. I think what I did was I set this up to where, you know, that second bench, <clears throat> you know, because in the old shop, it was clear across the room, uh, and that's what the milling machine was sitting on. So I think what I did was I set it up to where that second bench was going to be uh, my handle glue up bench, and I just forgot that, you know, when we we're doing the video here. Okay, so at first when I started mixing that epoxy, it was very, very stiff. Okay, my popsicle didn't want to move in the epoxy very much because it was cold. Now it's much, much easier. And we are at a minute and 12. So let me grab a couple of clamps. Okay, there's six of them. All right, so the pattern or the order I like to go in this is you'll notice I have the scale, the knife, the scale, right? So I need to grab the nearest scale, grab some epoxy, kind of evenly spread it all over everything except for up near the uh, the Ricasso area because that area if we put too much in there, when we squeeze it and it starts coming out, it's going to squeeze all over the front part of the blade. And we'll grab a pin, 
stick it in each hole. Now we're going to grab the top of the blade. Boom, put it in there. Now let's grab the other one. Do the same thing. Try to keep, you know, try to eyeball and kind of keep the same amount of epoxy on either scale. Just kind of keeps things a little bit more even. And we line up our pins. And of course this one will be starting to fight me here a little bit. There's some pliers. Okay, we'll get those to where they're squeezed through. Okay, just until they're just barely through there, right? Now we're gonna go ahead and put a clamp on the bottom and a clamp in the middle. And we're gonna set that one over there. Then we're gonna do the next one. We've got three minutes and 18 seconds. I don't usually talk to anybody when I uh, epoxy scales up. That's pretty even. You want to make sure you put enough epoxy on there to where there's enough to fill those epoxy rivets. Okay. So again, we'll go ahead and do that there. And this th there. We're at four minutes, so that's going to give me enough time to go ahead and get them. And I don't have quite enough epoxy to do that next one. That's okay. So, we're at our four minutes and 20 seconds, right? Now, take your whatever epoxy you have left and then stick the container over to the side, um, you know, where, your, where your rest of your knives are resting, all right? Now we can go ahead and pull our gloves, and this is where these pieces of paper come in handy. Actually, I know you're not gonna be able to see that, so let's pick, you, pick these up and come back over here. All right, so these little squares of paper towel, okay, what we're going to do with those and that one, that first set or that first little bit of epoxy must be still a little bit on the cold side because it's not squeezing out right. That's okay. We'll put an extra couple of clamps on there for a little bit more clamping pressure and it will. There we go. We'll give it a second to, to move in, move out. All right. This one right here is nice and fluid. So we've got a little bit of epoxy that's squeezing out. That's what these little bitty chunks of paper towel are for. Okay, so you can go ahead and wipe that there. Wipe on the other side. And having these little um, pieces of paper towel is a whole lot handier than um, grabbing a whole paper towel and trying to find a fresh corner every time you're doing this while you're watching the clock. Now this epoxy is starting to set up. It's at six minutes there. Okay, so then once we got the majority of it wiped off, we'll come back with that WD-40 soaked Q-tip. And we'll wipe the remainder of that epoxy off. Okay, we got most of it there. Just go ahead and take a couple of these to wipe off the excess WD-40. And if you have a set that's kind of giving you a little bit of grief, you know, before the epoxy sets up all the way, you know, you can grab one of these and make yourself a little chisel. And come up in there. 
You can't see this, right? Make yourself that little chisel and come up in there and clean that joint. Because like I said, this is a whole lot easier to clean now before that epoxy sets up all the way than it is to clean up while the epoxy set. I mean, you can still do it either way, but it's just easier now. All right, so now let's grow this side. And we should be just about the end of our our pot life. And we are. It's starting to set up. So instead of it wiping really smooth off of here, I'm having to more um, kind of cut it with the chisel point here, sort of. Okay, so that looks good. Need a little bit of WD-40 there. If you um, if you mess up and the epoxy sets, um, you can always come back with uh, you know acetone, denatured alcohol, uh, goo gone, you know a whole bunch of stuff will cut this epoxy, or a little bit of heat also will. Uh, will break an, an epoxy bond so not so much like with your handle material because if you introduce too much heat to your handle material you'll burn it and make it look all nasty but if you have you know a big old glob of epoxy up on the tip of the blade you know from your glove you can always hit it with a torch just kind of a kind of a flash heat and it'll soften up that epoxy bond quite a bit and then um, uh, and then it'll come right off okay all right so now we're at nine minutes and 26 seconds okay these pins I don't want them to stay in there okay because we want pins that are peened okay right now those pins are acting as a fastener in this direction and this direction okay so if you apply force to the top edge of this this scale and try pushing it this way those pins are going through there right and it's going to stop it it won't it won't push right or the same thing is if you push on that scale this way you know those pins are going through it so if you try to push on the scale that way or this way you know the pins will stop you know, until you get to the force required to either shin the, shear the pins or break the wood, right? But they have no holding force this way, all right? So if you were to do any sort of prying with this blade, those pins, they're not providing any protection against that. You'll just pop these scales right off. I mean, within reason, of course, right? But if we peen the heads of these pins, <coughs> now it makes a mechanical fastener right not just a pin okay now there's not really any way that we're going to pin the pins while they're epoxied in place like that right so what we need to do is we need to get those pins out of there so what we're going to do is we're going to wait until this epoxy is set but not cured that typically takes five to seven minutes or so with this with this type of epoxy we didn't get a, well, no, I guess that looks all right. So what we need to do is we need to find um, either a glob of the epoxy that's on here. Usually it'll, it will uh, kind of ooze out the sides. Okay, see I'm pushing into it and it's not giving and it's not attaching itself to the popsicle stick. Okay, so that means we're at about the right time. I mean, it's set up. It's past that five minute mark. Um, actually, we're at 11.4 now. So it's set up, but it's not completely cured. Remember that, you know, how it's gonna set, but it's not gonna be cured for, you know, however many hours of the next day. So you're gonna wanna grab the, your pins, or the pair of pliers, and you can twist them and see if they'll pull out. 
Now this, we missed our, we missed our window there. Um, so what we need is, we need a lighter. You know, that's the one bad thing about quitting smoking. You know, used to when I smoked, I, I had a lighter everywhere, right? I mean, I always had one in my pocket. Now it seems like I'm constantly searching for one of the dang things. So we just got a big lighter here. Remember how I was telling you about how heat will break the epoxy bond? So we're going to use that, and we're going to take this, take a little bit of heat, and we're going to heat up the end of the pin. You see that? Okay, now we don't want to heat the, the pin up so much that it scorches the wood around the hole. We just need to get enough heat on that pin to where the, the, the other pin has got enough, the other side of the pin has got enough heat that it breaks the epoxy bond on that side also. Okay. Now, grab it. And it comes right out. So again, on this bottom one, we grab a hold of it. It's not even twisting, right? It's just the, the pin is just getting chewed up by the jaws of the, the pliers. We'll heat it up a little bit. 30 seconds, a minute, you know, however long feels right. Boom, coming right out. In fact, this one could have used a little bit more heat. And sometimes, you know, you might get it halfway out and it gets stuck. Heat that thing up some more. You just want, don't want to heat it up so much that it scorches uh, the wood around the hole. I mean, if it does, to a point, um, we're actually going to be taper rimming these holes later anyway. So it's not the end of the world. But you don't want to make extra work for yourself either. Okay, so now you should be able to see through them, them holes. Let's bring it up some. Let me see daylight through that hole. Okay, but the clamps are there, plus most of the epoxy has already been set up. So now we take this and we put it off to the side. And we'll go ahead and pull these pins on this one too while we're here. I mean, remember at this point, um, well, honestly, at this point, I mean, it's still just a knife that you're working on, right? I mean, don't fall in love with these things until after they're finished. <clears throat> Actually, don't fall in love with them until after they're finished and you've carried them and used them for a month or so and, you know, you end up liking them. But at this point, I mean, you saw, um, I think yesterday when we were talking about the, uh, the etching, um, I think there was what? six or ten ten blades in there that I didn't like the the way that the um, you know the depth of the heat treat you know uh, I don't know if I did it yet I think so yeah they're there in the scrap box you know so they'll sit in that scrap box until the scrap box gets too full and then I'll throw the scrap box away and then uh, and then start it all over again your scrap box is actually a pretty important piece of your shop because let's say you, um, you, know, you want to do a test on a knife, right? <clears throat> a destructive test. Well, you don't want to do that on a knife that you might end up selling. You know, but those knives down there, um, I think these Neckers are, oh, I don't know. I'd have to look at the website. But I want to say they're around 200 bucks a piece, something like that, for a 1095 one that's been hand sanded. Um, with these, you know, semi-exotic woods on it, you know, so if let's say there were six of them in there, you know, it's 1200 bucks. I just, you know, chucked in the, into the trash can. So you might as well get some use out of them. So, you know, if you want to do a test, you know, like a, like a 90 degree flex test, you know, just to, you know, to see how you're doing or, um, you know, an edge retention test or an edge flex test or, you know, something that, Let's just do a couple of them. So these are two of those, right? All right, so this one right here, 
the hardened portion goes up to there, right? So that, I would bet that's going to pass a 90 degree flex test. I mean, not that the 90 degree flex test is like the end all be all of testing, but you know, it is kind of cool, you know, to show that, that you can make steel do, you know, some pretty abusive things and still be okay. So the standard is let's, you know, clamp it up a third of the way on the blade and then bend it over. Boom, 90 degree flex test. Big deal, right? Let's go the other way. That's 90 degrees the other way, right? And then we can straighten it back up. Since it's uh, kind of on the light side, we'll straighten it back up. Heck, you can straighten that thing right back up and keep using it, okay? Um, actually, let's do a fun one. How about what happens when we do a 90 degree uh, twist test, okay? Ha, look at there. The edge snapped. <coughs> see how this is this is pretty cool here. Okay, see how that break uh, actually let's flex it back so you can kind of see. Okay, so see how that break starts. I have a pointer. See how that brake starts right there at the edge, goes up, hits that hardening line, right? And then it, it splits off. Instead of going straight through, it comes up and then turns over. That's pretty cool. And But then it stops, all right? I mean, heck, even when we bent it back, it stopped. So now, um, let's actually take a look. Uh, yeah, we'll bend that brake back over and snap it off. Now you can look at your grain size. See how it's nice and silky looking up in the hardened portion? And then down in here, it gets a little bit bigger. And then here, it gets quite a bit bigger. You know, that's what, um, you know, your heat cycling and the quench does to your grain size. So if you wanted to do a test like that, and you know, I mean, reach in your scrap box, find one that you kind of sort of remembered why it was in the scrap box. And do your test. Let's do a, an edge deformation test. Okay. And I've showed you this before where you, uh, you know, because everybody always talks about the, an edge flex test, right? You know, where you flex it. You guys should be able to see that. You see that reflection of light there where that edge is flexing up over the, the brass rod? Okay. Well, they always say that if you pass that and you flex the edge and it flexes up and over the brass rod and then comes back down and it returns to true, that your heat treat is perfect. Well, that's just kind of the beginning of it, all right? What you need to do is every knife is going to fail if you push that edge too far, right? Well, you as the maker get to choose. Do you want it to fail as in it, you want it to bend over and stay bent over? Or do you want it to fail where, you know, it'll chip out? There's nothing right or wrong with either way, you know, but as long as you as a maker have enough control over your steel to choose which way you want it to fail, that's the important part. <clears throat> okay, this one right here, I actually heard it chip a little bit there, but what happened was, was actually just about perfect. What happens is, is you flex that thing and you flex it and then finally it chips out, right? And this actually did, it cracked first and then started chipping, which is just about, just about right. I mean, look how much I'm flexing that thing before it cracks. Dang near perfect. Now, you can take it and increase your angle and knock a big old chip out of it, all right? But if you hold it at a pretty good pretty good sharpening angle and press down and press down and press down and it flexes and then finally cracks that's just about where I like them to be because that way you get you've set that edge up for the maximum working hardness so it re will retain an edge for a good amount of time but you still have I mean a pretty good a reasonable amount of strength there in the edge and then you have more strength you know backing up in the softer spine. Okay, so, 
sorry I guess we kind of went off went off of the handle attachment uh, uh, portion of the the video there but everybody always likes well I guess I can't say everybody always likes but you know now you know what that blade does with that steel type that heat treat that depth of harden or quench um, you know I mean it's it's a good thing to check your blades once in a while right and I mean the the screw ups that's what you want to test with on anyhow uh, that way you know you're you at least get something out of that money that uh, that you honestly just wasted by by screwing the thing up okay so um, so we've got these two handles glued up tomorrow or the next day I'll show you how to grind them um, and then how to start hand sanding them and everything and then we'll probably actually do a whole video on this new uh, pin installation technique that I came up with oh I don't know a year ago whatever it was because it is very cool and I, I, I like it quite a bit it gives really good results that are way faster and much more repeatable which is the name of the game right so this is going to be a long video I don't think I'm going to cut it in half just because well just because so again, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can visit me on the web, caltoncutlery.com. Hope you enjoyed the video, and we will see you uh, tomorrow or Monday, something like that. We'll talk to you later.